Coming up in this end of series special, I look at the multitude of multifaces. I play some games. Jeff and I have a chat. And I end with some compilations. Let's get on then. In episode 57, I looked at software protection and the lengths companies went to to stop their games being copied. In that feature, I mentioned the arrival and rise of the snapshot devices, small interfaces that plugged into your spectrum and allowed any game to be halted and saved to various formats, including tape, microdrive and disc. Some titles detected some interfaces though, but that's not relevant for this feature. When did these interfaces appear? How many were there? Who made them and how did they all work? These questions will be addressed here, so strap yourselves in. For this feature, I'll be using a 48k Spectrum linked to Interface 1 and the V-Drive. I've done this for convenience instead of using a real microdrive. I will also load games via microdrive for convenience and speed, and I'll be trying to use the same game throughout the entire tests. On to the interfaces then. The first mention of any such device of this kind was in March 1985, and it was a device called the Doubler a device produced by Draysoft. Now the doubler came in two flavours. One allowed you to connect two cassette recorders to it, and the copy was done as the game loaded. The other one, the Mark II, was a simple looking interface with a complex procedure to move your games to another format. Ignoring the tape to tape version, which wasn't really a multiface as we know it, the second version was a little closer to what we're looking at. Now Draysoft either sold or licensed their interface to Evershed Micros, as their interface, called the Interface 3, had Draysoft's name printed on the circuit board, and it works in exactly the same way. This advert has both of them mentioned, the Mark 1 doubler, with the twin cassettes, and Interface 3. Interface 3 was advertised just after the Draysoft version, so really, it's the third one to come along, but really the second one, if that makes sense. Anyway, here's Interface 3, or Draysoft's doubler Mark 2, whichever you fancy. It comes with a small manual, the interface itself, and either a microdrive or cassette with the program required later. I'll have to transfer this to microdrive again to make things quicker. Mine also came with a sheet from Evershin Micros explaining why they had supplied Autotrans on tape, and also pointing out that they had issues with John Barrington's squash, and they supplied a small typing program to fix it. The interface works in a strange way, and not as you would expect from a multiface device. There are no prompts to work from. Instead, you have to work blind. After plugging it in and setting it up, you load a game. You press the button and press record on your cassette player and the version of the game will be saved to tape. Let's give it a go then. I'll be using the CAS device to save the game onto instead of a real tape. When you go through the process, at the end of it you will see a black screen with green borders and that means the game has saved successfully. You now have to turn off the spectrum and remove interface 3. You then load the conversion tool, you load the saved game, and it then saves to microdrive. By default it will save the current screen, as this may hold some hidden machine code, and you are asked to check this during the process. But it's not required if you want to save space. All of this took about 15 minutes, swapping tapes around and in the 80s microdrive cartridges as well. Now let's try and load it. Now the first time I tried this, it loaded very quickly and I thought there must be something wrong, so I went through the whole process again and changed the name of the saved file. The screen is corrupt, but this is normal, as we shall see with many other interfaces of this type, but the game plays fine, and even plays without the interface. And as you can see, there are three files on the cartridge, minor, which is the loader, MI1 and MI2, and even though it's 40k worth of data, it still loads pretty quickly. Next came the Mirage Microdriver for Mirage Microcomputers, around July 1985. Now I have one of these with an updated ROM, version 2, however it doesn't work. I grabbed another one and plugged it all in to try it out. Now this device works how we all remember, you press a button and you get a nice little menu. Here we can load, save, poke, run or reset the spectrum with the new command. Hitting save asks you for a file name and then a drive number and after a few seconds it saves fine. It creates a single file, which
which will not load using the normal method. To get the game to work, you have to load it via the microdriver menu. You select L to load, you type in the file name, you select which device number to use, and off it goes. When it's finished, it goes back to the microdrive menu, where you have to press R to run the game. How obscure! Let's try the poke option then. Hitting the red button, you select poke. Let's go for an infinite lives one, and seeing it's the bug bite version of Manic Miner, we'll use 35136,0, and that works fine. An easy to use device. Shame that the game needs the interface to run though, but I suppose it kept them out of trouble. If you remember, I said at the beginning I had two of these devices, and one didn't work. I also have the datasheet that came with the new version explaining the changes, and I did send this to WAS about eight years ago when it was totally ignored. Anyway, I decided to try and swap the ROMs out. The differences from the versions can be seen on the datasheet, so I'm not going to go through them here. I carefully swapped out the version 2 ROM into the working circuit board. And it's easy to get into, there's just two screws at the back. Put it all back together, and yes, we have version 2 ROM working. It has a few extra functions. Copy sends the screen to the ZX printer, and Dump sends the entire memory to Microdrive. Handy if you want to try and hack the game. Next to arrive was Interface 007 from ZX Guaranteed, around September 1985. This bare board interface worked like the early unit. You pressed a key, which produced a coloured border, and then you pressed a series of other keys to save the game back to tape at varying speeds. It could also copy games to Microdrive, but again you had to load the copied version first, and then converting it to Microdrive. A lot of messing about, and as I don't own one, I can't show it. So we'll move on to the next one then, Specmate, from AT&Y Computing, around October 1985. Now I don't have the original version of this, but I do have the recreated version that works exactly the same way. So let's give this a try. It's the same routine and the same game. You press the button, and again we get a border change, and you have to follow the instructions to press just the right key to save to microdrive. There is no screen prompt at all. So to save to microdrive, once you've pressed the button, you press M, and the border will change to red. You then press N for normal load, and the border goes to blue. You then press 2, and the border goes to magenta. You then type in a file name, and there's nothing on screen to say you're doing it, so you have to use the keyboard beeps as a guide. You then press enter, and the game will save to microdrive. The screen corrupts, as we've seen before, and on the microdrive you have four files. My save was called Miner, one of them being the screen, which is the 6918k file, but you have an option not to store the screen while saving, by pressing a different combination of keys, and this will save 6k of space on your microdrive cartridge. You can also save to wafer drive, beta disk, opus discovery, and the challenge sprint, as well as an option to use a turbo loader for the challenge, or tape. Once you've pressed the right buttons, the game is saved to microdrive. At least you don't have to save it to tape first and then convert it. Does the game run without the unit? Yes it does! A bonus for software pirates then. It's a bit fiddly to use, especially without screen prompts, but it does the job. Next comes the most well-known device, the Multiface 1, from Romantic Robot, around February 1986. We should all be familiar with this. Sadly I don't have one, but I do have the follow-up, the Multiface 1 to 8, released around April 1987. I originally owned a Multiface 1, but it developed a fault, and upon sending it back, Romantic Robot replaced it with a 1 to 8 version. Let's have a go then. You load the game, you press the red button, and you get a nice menu. From here you can poke memory, view memory, change it, print, jump to another address, or view memory banks if you have a 128K machine. A nice set of tools, and an improvement on previous interfaces. You can save the game to tape, microdrive, opus discovery, wafer drive, or even a Kempston or beta disk in later models. Saving is easy, prompting for a file name, and off it goes. The game loads fine, even without the interface plugged in. I noticed that the game is saved in four files. Those are the ones you can see called minor, and that's just like the Specmate did. But the files are different sizes, and much larger too. This device, and Multiface 1, also had 8K of RAM on board, which you could use for your own games. 
Romantic Robot and others created tools you could load into this space. Let's have a play with one of them then, Lifeguard. First you load the program from tape, and then it writes the program to the 8K RAM. You then load the game and press the button. And instead of the normal multi-face menu, you get the Lifeguard screen. Lifeguard enables you to find infinite life pokes, or infinite ammo pokes. You first set the number of lives, or whatever it is you want to change. In the case of Manic Miner, I'm setting this to 3, but it didn't work, so I then set it to 2. That's the number of minor willies at the bottom left hand of the screen. You then set the method to search, either decrease A or decrease HL, apparently two of the most common methods for decreasing lives, or scores, or ammo. You then press S, and it goes away and searches memory. If it finds anything, it will display the address, so you can jump back into the game and test it. And here, you can see that it's found the Manic Miner poke. There were other things you could load into the Multifaces 8K RAM, such as Genie, the dissembler, and there were tools for things like graphic hacking and sprite locating. Let's continue with our multi-face journey though. Other interfaces arrived in 86 and mid-87 from Daytel. They were the Snapshot and Snapshot 2. Let's try that. Here's the Snapshot 2. This is an empty shell, in that it does nothing until you load code into it, and the code only stays there while the power is on. So each time you want to use it, you have to load the code in each time. The program can be loaded from Microdrive though, so I suppose it's a bit of a bonus. You should get a message telling you the device is ready, and now you can load your game. When you've done that, you press the button, and select Save, and type in the file name. And this takes a very long time for some reason, and I've no idea why, and we're talking over three minutes. The Microdrive light was on, but nothing seemed to be happening. Once it finally loads, you're greeted with the snapshot menu, where you have to press G to start the game. Now that amount of time is almost the equivalent of waiting for a tape to load, so I don't really see the point in it. This interface also has no option to search memory, but it does let you type in an address and see the value, but that's really just a peek command. A quick look and it seems that it saved a single file of an unknown type, and the file is around 28k in size, so a bit of compression maybe. The problem being, it's just too slow to decompress and load. This is definitely a step backwards from the current trend of devices, a poor man's multiface then. And finally, the next interface was inevitable really, the Multiface Plus 3, again from Romantic Robot, around November 1987. This one adds the ability to save to the new Spectrum Plus 3's disk drive. We all know the drill by now, so with a blank disk in hand, I loaded Manic Miner from the CAS. Pressing the red button, I got the familiar menu. Selecting to save, requested a file name, and then it saved a 30k file to disk. Loading it went okay, but I did have to activate the multiface before it would continue. The functions are the same as multiface 1 to 8 throughout, so nothing new. It's a good device if you wanted to move all your old tape collections to disk. Where this unit falls down, however, and all units of this type in general, is with multiloads. They can only save what's in memory at the time, so for games that have multiple levels loaded from tape or disk, forget it. As for the check during load to see if the device is connected, later there were tools to get round this. And this device, like the 128 model, also had 8k of RAM, to load the things we've talked about. And that's about it. That's our roundup of multi-face devices. This is Butch Hard Guy, released by Advanced Software Promotions in 1987. Any similarities to a certain well-known actor? Well, maybe the loading screen will help. Anyway, your mission is to rescue forgotten ex-army vets imprisoned by the notorious Dr. Tai Fu. Yes, it's the T. And there are 20 levels in the game. The vets are guarded by near indestructible combat droids. They can be knocked over, and can, if you're fast enough, be destroyed, but they explode, so you've got to get out of the way quickly. The best option though is to avoid them altogether. Now when I first played this game, I thought it was bugged. I could not jump onto the platforms. Then I realised, to jump higher, you have to press the fire and jump at the same time. A rather annoying control choice, I think, and one that detracts from the game immensely.
there is obviously no need to have a double jump. This just stinks of the programmers deliberately making the game harder, for no reason. Why not just have a normal jump? Because there's one already in the game, but it's not used for anything. To free the vets, you have to smash the cage they are in, and to do this, you have to stand near the cage, punch and move at the same time. Just standing still does nothing. Another failure in the control and mechanics. The robots are a real pain, sometimes dropping down platforms, other times jumping over the gaps. Hitting them once does nothing, hitting them a few times causes them to fall over, and then get back up straight away, killing you. Hitting them for an undisclosed certain number of times will cause them to explode, but it's very difficult to successfully do that. Sometimes I hit them, and they just kill me anyway. The punch animation is going, the punch sound is playing, and yet the robots kill you. Yet another choice that causes frustration, and one that again does not need to be in there. Even knowing how to jump higher does not make the game any easier. It's all about timing and waiting for the right moment to jump, watching the robots, trying to guess if they're going to drop or jump, and then hoping that your jump works, because sometimes it just doesn't. Another bad control decision is that you can't double jump and move at the same time. You have to be stationary to do that. Who on earth thought that would be a good idea? After many attempts, I could not rescue more than two vets, and sometimes another vet popped back up into a broken cage, magically restoring it, which is illogical and frustrating, especially if you've headed off to the other side of the screen to rescue another one. I did eventually get to level 2, after a lot of swearing and frustration, but didn't last very long there. I had to turn off the spectrum and go have a drink. The screen backgrounds are okay, with nice use of attributes, and the level layouts are fair, and the graphics are well defined. Sound is average really, but the gameplay is just so broken and frustrating. There is absolutely no justification for the double jump, or the multiple ways in which you can destroy robots that randomly work. A game, then, I would urge you not to play if you are of a nervous disposition. This is Lemmings, released by Cygnosis in 1991. Now, Lemmings is probably one of the most famous titles for 8 and 16-bit machines. It was converted onto many formats after its original release on the Amiga in 91. It's somewhat unique, or at least was when it was released, seeing you guiding a group of wandering carefree lemmings to safety, or just blowing them up for fun. Each level begins and they drop out of a trapdoor at the top of the screen. You start with a limited set of options, and the idea is that you select any lemming on screen, changing them into a certain type of lemming. So for example, you can make one a digger that digs downwards, or you can change them into a bridge builder or blocker. You only have a set amount of times that you can use each one per level, and this is where the strategy comes in. The control system is a bit dodgy though in my opinion. The cursor speeds up the longer you hold down the key, often shooting past its intended target, which is a bit annoying. To select which action to use, you press the number keys, so for the digger, in level 1, you press the zero key. Using these different types, you have to get a specified number of lemmings to safety. The Spectrum version has 60 levels, split into fun, tricky, taxing and mayhem categories. Each level has varied obstacles including rivers, lava, netting, high drops and a whole lot more. The 16-bit versions obviously used a mouse, so controlling the cursor is different on the Spectrum. The graphics could have been much better in my opinion. Some of them look like they were converted from the 16-bit versions and downscaled, leaving a very pixelated look on some items and walls. Some look bland and uninteresting. The use of monochrome is a bit of a letdown too. 
I'm sure they could have added more colour elements to the background, especially where there was no interaction. Despite these things though, the game is fantastic to play. I do miss the Amiga music playing away, and the comical sound effects, but the Spectrum makes a good attempt at it. The graphics, apart from the aforementioned digitised look, are fine, and the Lemmings have great character. As you progress, more and more Lemmings types opens up to you, with limited uses. Level design is also fantastic, very well thought out, as you would expect from a classic 16-bit title, but it's amazing how they squeeze so much into the Spectrum version. Longer levels allow you to scroll the screen to see what's coming up, and the game is just slick in every aspect. For the Ultimate version though, there's a 2020 edition, which gives you not only improved AY music, but also mouse control via the Kempston mouse. The game seems faster too, but then again it is running on a pentagon. Overall, a very well implemented game that's addictive and fun. When this came out, I, along with many others, had moved over to the Amiga or Atari, so missed this. For Spectrum owners though, a brilliant game, and of course, we all like blowing those little critters up. For people coming to the world of microcomputers after 1985, Compilations were commonplace on the shelves of many stores. A collection of games for a slightly higher price, usually consisting of one or two decent titles, and then padded out with fillers. Compilations though started much earlier, and even on the ZX81, they were there. Even Sinclair themselves threw out a few. Back then, companies were eager to sell to early adopters, and throw out collections of their basic games at knockdown prices. They were advertised in the back of magazines, and you had no idea what to expect. Some made it onto store shelves, and I remember buying this one from J.K. Gray. When the Spectrum arrived, smaller companies and bedroom programmers still sold compilations of their games, and I think this is the first category of compilation, the type-in basic games. Let's take a look at one of these then. Here is the Spectrum Arcade Pack, released by SeaTech. The adverts first started to appear in November 1982, boasting 8 brilliant games for only £5. The compilation certainly looks and feels like a homemade job. The inlay is thick cardboard and printed only on one side, and the image is hand-drawn. The tape is just a standard audio tape, and the games included are, well, let's see. Okay, ah, this takes ages to eventually get to the main menu, so we'll, we'll skip this bit. The first game then is Fruit Machine, a basic, in both senses of the word, Fruit Machine game. It has a hold and nudge feature, but let's move on quickly. Next we get Luna Lander. You are told the controls are U, H and S, but given no indication what those actually do. Okay, a very odd version of the game then, and one that's impossible. Moving on, we have Crazy Race. Ugh, cursor controls. Here you have to run over men and dogs to score points. What sort of sick game is this? Moving on, and we have random beeps, okay? This game seems to be bugged, it won't start. Breaking into it, and I had to change a few things to actually get it to work. Way to go, SeaTech. It's a poor version of Missile Command. Quickly moving on, and next we have Sub Hunt. A very long wait, and we get... 
flickery graphics. Yeah. Here you drop bombs onto subs, which is a fairly decent typing game, I suppose. Next we have a game with no name, but the description kind of gives it away. It's a breakout clone. And a pretty poor one at that, really, as you can see. And now we have uh, some music. And a game called Polecat. This is probably the best game on here, to be honest. Guide your rabbit to get the carrots and avoid the polecat. The polecat does look like a mini kangaroo, though, and just homes in on your rabbit. Not much fun at all. And finally, oh no, a bomber game. Yes, we've all seen this sort of thing before. All in all, a bunch of typing quality games thrown together and sold for £5, but we are talking 1982 here. As mentioned earlier, this is what I think the first category of compilation is, the typing. The second type is liquidated or takeover licensed stock. A company goes bankrupt and the rights are bought out, and the games thrown together into a compilation. Here you would get better quality games, but this category didn't really start to appear until companies started to struggle, and things got bad for them. Also, with 48k being more common, the 16k titles just couldn't make the grade, in the majority of cases. A typical example is Imagine Software, going bust in 1984, and the rights were bought by Beaujolais, who quickly threw out two compilations, Value Pack 16k and Value Pack 48k. The games within these were decent quality when they were released. After all, they are full commercial titles. The 16k pack contained Arcadia. Considered the first proper quality shoot 'em up on the spectrum. Smooth if a little flickery graphics. Multiple waves of aliens. Different strategies, nice sound, and possibly the first use of a particle explosion. The game was written to work with a fuller joystick, which is why the ship sometimes moves on its own, but there is a poked version to fix this. Next we have Jumping Jack, a simplistic looking title, but a very addictive game. Easy controls, challenging gameplay, and a game people still have fond memories of. Next is Molar Mall, a strange game about protecting teeth from decay. And lastly we get R. Didums, a novel unique game that is diminished by flickering graphics. A good idea, apart from the odd way in which you stack the bricks to get out. A decent playable game this. Missing from this compilation is Imagine's other 16k title, Schizoids. This was supposed to be the follow-up to Arcadia, but more or less was unplayable. I guess that's why they left it out. The next category is Charity Compilations. The first one, as far as I know, was Soft Aid, organised by Rod Cousins of Quicksilver to help the famine in Ethiopia. This had 10 games, all contributed by different software houses, with some good quality titles amongst them. Ant Attack, for example, a stellar title and brilliant game. Rescue your partner from the ant-infested city, use bombs carefully, use the city buildings and structures to evade the ants, switch viewing angles and run like hell. Also included was Cockatoni Wolf from Elite, a weird time-travelling, wing-flapping collect -em up with decent graphics for the time. Collect all the stars on a level to progress to the next time zone, and each zone had different graphics. There was Starbike from The Edge, a sort of Defender-style game that wasn't really much good, and many more. Not a bad collection of games on there, although there is some padding. Sorcery was a bit poor, as was Jack and the Beanstalk. Despite having nice screenshots in the advert, the game was, for me, just frustrating. And this takes us on to the next category, flogging a dead horse. Yes, older titles thrown together to try and make some extra money from people that missed them the first time round. We all know these compilations, and there were quite a lot of them. Sometimes from the same company, sometimes just a collection of random games, with the usual great titles and extra padding. Take this as an example, Computer Classics from 1987, a very 80s style inlay. This is from Beaujolais again, but does have Exelon included. A 
superb game, originally released in 1985. It has brilliant graphics, great action, great sound and superb gameplay. I can't get very far on this, but I do like to play it, for some odd masochistic reason. The compilation continues with more good games, Dynamite Dan, originally from 1985. This is a brilliant, if difficult, platform game. Great sound effects and tunes, simple gameplay but hard as nails. Mediocre titles then follow these two, Into the Eagle's Nest from 1987, a top-down mix of Gauntlet and Alien Brood. And Cauldron 2 from 1986, the follow-up to the first broomstick flying platformer. This time though you take control of a pumpkin, which is a bit reminiscent of Whizball and still a bit odd. And probably the one that appeals least to people buying this would be Aliens. This 1986 game based on the classic Ridley Scott film is more or less a strategy game, swapping characters and moving about the ship. I never really liked this. Not all compilations had fillers though. In 1985, They Sold a Million was released, containing four classic games. Saber Wolf from Ultimate Play the Game, the highly rated Mace-style jungle exploration game, Daily Thompson's Decathlon from Ocean, the joystick-killing track and field game from Ocean, Jet Set Willy from Software Projects, and we all know about this one. Good job Jeff's not here and Beachhead from US Gold. Not a single filler in there, and all great games. For people coming to the spectrum in its later life, this compilation would have been great value. And now onto the last category, discs. When the Plus 3 was released, companies wanted to cash in on the disc format, so threw out various older titles on disc compilations. These usually followed the same formula, with a few good titles padded out with less than average ones. Take this, Solid Gold from US Gold. Now I'm not sure which is the classic title on here, possibly Gauntlet. A good arcade conversion, lots of action and decent gameplay. The other ones though, well, it's a real mixed bag of different formats. Golf, something that appeals to a small group of users. Winter Games, if you like those sort of thing. Ace of Aces, described as a mix of flight sim and shoot em up. Mm. And Infiltrator. Yep, yeah, okay, another game that's um, a bit dull, to be honest. I suppose it wasn't bad for just under £9, but the games were just not the best they could have got. Of course, the best disc collection by far was the Ultimate Collection, even though they missed out Underworld, but that's not really a bad thing, in my opinion. At this point, I would like to mention a few of the compilations. Don't buy this from Firebird, released in 1985. A Mickey take of bad games, harking back to the good old days. And even though the title says don't buy it, people did. It contained four very, very bad games, but even then, nothing compared to the C-Tech titles we saw earlier. Let's have a quick look anyway. The inlay claims this cassette contains five of the most uninspiring games ever to disgrace the 48k spectrum. First up is Road Ace. Yes, it is terrible. The controls don't work properly. The graphics are awful. Mm. Okay. Next we have Fido. You control a dog that has to move around, wag its tail and hit moles on the head. Yep, okay. As he moves around, the food goes down. He can go and have some more. And on it goes. If you don't get to the mole in time, it turns green, and then it appears at the top of the screen. If you get too many of these, it's game over. Next we have Weasel Willy. Here you guide a weasel. Well, it doesn't look like a weasel to me, but anyway, you guide it around a field, try not to bump into trees. There's nothing to collect, no animation. Just wait for a certain amount of time before moving to the next field. Hmm... And then Fido 2. If the first one wasn't enough, here's the follow-up. It's more or less the same game, except you have a chasing enemy and a different background. Same idea, same graphics, same terrible game. And finally, oh dear, a fruit machine. Yes, a very, very slow fruit machine game. 
and it's not even fun to play. And on to the next compilation worthy of a mention. PCW Magazine released the best of their type-ins in one big compilation, with a book showing the listings and a tape in case you couldn't be bothered to type them out. These are interesting to go through, but don't expect too much. They're all typing games after all, and I covered this in a Patreon video and I needed a lie down afterwards. And finally, the granddaddy of all compilations, the Codemasters CD Games Pack. 30 games on one CD. This required a different method of loading, and I'll be covering this in a future episode. And that was a quick look at compilations. And it's a welcome back to the Let's Chat or Let's Talk section. We've had some uh, comments about it, and I, I know we're going to bring it back for the next series. And I think Jeff's in agreement with that. I am. It always seems popular, and it did get some good comments. Although, when we went back and looked, Paul, we could only find these three. <laughs> we could. So it's back by popular demand. It is. And this is the first one, and we'll continue into the next series. We will. That We're just doing this as a test, just to warm ourselves up for not only the live show coming soon, but also the next series. So what I thought is, as we'd gone back and looked at comments, I picked out a few that we could talk about. So this is a let's talk about comments. Right Oh, Something that seems to get people was my pronunciation. Oh, and mine as well. When this goes out, I will have also reviewed the book Doom's Dark's Revenge, which I think I pronounced right there. Doom's Dark or Doom Dark? Doom. <laughs> Doom, oh, Doom Dark, not Doom's Dark. Um, I'll have reviewed that book, and I'm pretty sure in that review, I sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong, so apologies again. Okay. But Paul, there was one on your pronunciation. I'm this sure one. I was. Yes. Moriarty. Uh, but that was the only one I could find, so your pronunciation's clearly better than mine. There were a lot of comments in the early shows, and somebody's even said, I sound like Johnny Ball. If, if anybody's old enough to remember Johnny Ball. I'm old enough to remember Johnny Ball. Uh, I can assure people I'm not Johnny Ball. And so they'll find out in the live show. One that I thought there were more of was this one. The first comments? I had to go back quite a while to... I thought there seemed to be almost a... I like time when it was trendy for people to go, I was first. There was, I remember it on um, a lot of the shows that I watched, there were people putting things like, yay, first again, or missed out. And it seems somebody's trying it here as well. One I feel I must mention was the comments about my pallet cycling section that I did. Oh, yes, that, that, section was, that, that, I that did. split the audience. It did indeed. Really, really apologise to anyone who it made feel ill. Really, really didn't realise and apologise for anyone who did. Yeah, maybe you, it was because I'd been watching the guy who did the pallet cycling originally and his videos again and again and again, just thinking about how he did it. Th this one I thought was interesting, which is your offer in Portuguese, Paul. Yes, I didn't look it up, but uh, you have kindly translated it for me. Uh, do you want to read it? <laughs> Hello, dear YouTube blogger. We would like to work with you to produce an ad for our platform. We will pay you very well for the ad. Please reply if you are interested. Thank you. And didn't you just delete that comment? Uh, I'm not sure, did I? Oh, I might have deleted it. Other things that seem to be very popular. This one's uh, popular, which is, yeah, people asking for an Amiga show and you replying, there is one. And Ori it's very good. Originally, when they asked me to, well, when they suggested I do an Amiga show as well, this was before the Amiga show started. The Amiga is my second most favourite machine, as most people know, and I would have loved to have done an Amiga show. However, the cost is very inhibiting. It's, um, I mean, the, the Spectrum things are expensive enough as it is, mm. and to start on the Amiga, I mean, just an Amiga 500 is crazy money at the moment. Um, and then, of course, if there's going to be an Amiga show, people were also asking for a Commodore 64 show. Well, I mean, I've got nothing against the Commodore 64. I owned one for about three months in my life, in between Spectrums and Amigas. But no, again, cost and time. Most of my time, well, all of my time is taken up doing the Spectrum show. So and there was, mm. unless I stopped doing this, that there was, um, there's no chance for me to do an Amiga or a 64 or any other type of show. There was this comment by Monkey Island that I think was tongue-in-cheek, but you don't. I thought so. I actually thought that was someone taking the mickey rather than an actual serious comment. 
All right, okay. Well, well, think... The lack of um, smiley or emoji or anything, it was difficult to tell. It, it, yeah. I thought it was just somebody that were hard ventured onto the channel by accident and just gave it a try and didn't really get what the show was. I may be completely wrong. It may be tongue-in-cheek, in which case I apologise for the serious reply, but I don't know. <laughs> and last one, and actually a comment from Lee's Games in Malcolm. To be honest with you, this wasn't all of the ones I found as well. I only went back for about a year. Your your typing games do get a lot of love. Everyone seems to love your typing section. Yeah, it was a, it was a bit of a decision to go with that because typing games aren't the best. They're there for a reason. That's to teach people how to code and to get a free game, but the games are not very good. But personally, I like typing games. I like to type them out. I like to see them work. The thing is, what do you do with a typing game? The only the only route I could go down was to typing games that were not already available because then yeah. that, that's an extra sort of layer on top of the, here's a typing game, this is what it does. And by the way, this has not been seen for 30 years because nobody's typed it out yet. And, you know, checking in all the internet archives and type fantastic website. So I think I've contributed about 20 games that nobody's seen for, for 30 years. And I think it's, I enjoy it when I've got the time. I thought that was a good one to, to end on because people absolutely love the typing. Excellent, and I can confirm there won't be a typing section on the live show. <laughs> <laughs> Never before seen typing. <laughs> yeah, we'll type it in in real time while we're there. Yeah, well, that's that's right. the whole show. Just me and you talking and typing in a typing game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could we could we could kind of say, oh, and then we'll do typing corner where we'll be live typing in. Yeah, <laughs> um, but do, do, do it sort of a relay. Get some other people involved. <laughs> <laughs>